discussions, comparative studies, and field experience practices. In order to support the teaching and learning activities, we have four complexes of campuses. Campus 1, located at Jalan Dr. Cipto Jalan Lontar. This campus consists of representative and modern buildings for teaching and learning activities. This campus consists of central building, main building, student activity center, library, graduate program building as well as a representative auditorium meeting hall for national class concerts and international seminars. Campus 2, located at Jalan Sriwijaya. This campus has a hotel available for both students and public in general as well as a large meeting room for teacher professional training programs and various other large-scale meetings. Campus 3, located at Jalan Bendan Duo. This campus has a building for students' practices, especially mechanical and electrical engineering department students. This campus supports various activities to increase electrical, mechanical, and architecture skills. Campus 4, located at Jalan Gajah. This campus has a teaching learning building complex and a sports centers including basketball, badminton, futsal, and other athletic sports activities. This campus also has a dormitory building provided for students as well as a high school laboratory school which was established by the Universitas PGRI Semarang. Why do you have to choose Ogris as a place to study? We realize the importance of international relations to connect the discourse currently developing in the international world. This is where we establish a collaboration to open up opportunities for career leader to students and lecture exchanges credit transfer and double degree program, join internship and research, and publication with our reputable university partners. We believe that in our fast-paced and competitive world, there are basic competencies every young generation has to possess, namely excellence and distinction, excellence in either emotional and spiritual intelligence, and the ability to retain the personality as a culture human being. Please join Ogris. Jim Su at a glance. Don Mariano Marcos Memorial State University, or DIMSU, is the lone state university in La Union, Philippines. DIMSU was created through Presidential Decree 1778 on January 15, 1981 by former President Ferdinand E. Marcos. Founded on the philosophy, total human development with appropriate competencies, DIMSU was born from the merging of five former schools of La Union, namely, Don Mariano Marcos Memorial State College at Baknotan La Union, La Union School of Arts and Trade at City of San Fernando La Union, Community College of La Union at City of San Fernando La Union, Southern Ilocos Polytechnic State College at Agoo La Union, and Sapilang Elementary School at Baknotan La Union. The university has three major campuses, namely the North La Union Campus in Baknotan, the Mid La Union Campus in San Fernando City, and the South La Union Campus, which is found in the towns of Agoo, Santa Tomas, and Rosario La Union. Jimsu also houses the Open University System, which is located in San Fernando City, La Union. Jimsu is the home of two national centers, the National Apiculture Research, Trading and Development Institute, or NARTDI, and the Sericulture Research and Development Institute, or SRDI, anchored in seven core values, namely service, productivity, excellence, commitment, innovativeness, advocacy, and leadership. Jimsu envisions to become a globally competitive university and is empowered to provide high-quality instruction, research, and extension. 
Its undiminished goal is to lead in transforming human resources into productive, self-reliant citizens and responsible leaders. Living with its mantra, embracing world-class standards, Jimsu is ISO certified. Through the strong leadership of the current president, Dr. Jaime E. Park Manuel Jr. and the vice presidents and the teamwork and commitment of all DIMSU personnel, DIMSU passed ISO 9001-2015 on November 19, 2020. The audit scope includes the provision of instruction, research, extension, and support services. Overall, 24 processes were audited. The ISO 9001-2015 Certificate No. 20.67.PH112906.00 originally approved on November 19, 2020, was issued on November 29, 2020. Further, on November 8-12, 2021, DIMSU passed the first surveillance audit and the certificate attesting that the University QMS conforms to the requirements of ISO 9001-2015, number 20.67.PH112906.01, was issued on November 29, 2021. As an affirmation of DIMSU's excellent systems in rewards and recognition, learning and development, and recruitment selection and performance management, the Philippine Civil Service Commission or CSC conferred DIMSU with certificates of recognition. These implies that the three systems have reached maturity level 2. Also, Jimsu's North Lonian campus passed the Institutional Sustainability Assessment by the Commission on Higher Education. Jimsu has 109 academic programs broken down into 13 doctorate degree programs, 31 master's degree programs, 58 baccalaureate degree programs, and 7 diploma or certificate programs. In addition, the university boasts of 20 academic programs that have been pre-accredited to level 4 status by the Accrediting Agency of Chartered Colleges and Universities of the Philippines, or AACCUP. These programs are BS Agroforestry, Bachelor of Elementary Education, BS Agribusiness Management, BS in Environmental Science, BS in Information Systems, PhD in Technological Education Management, MA in Technology Education, PhD in Development Administration, MDA Majors in Business Administration and Public Administration, BS Industrial Technology, BS in Hospitality Management, BS in Business Administration, PhD Science Education, MA in Science Education, MA in Mathematics Education, MA in Teaching Music, MA in Guidance and Counseling, BS Mathematics, BS Biology, BS Computer Science. Likewise, 18 programs are Level 3 re-accredited, 15 are Level 2 re-accredited, and 22 are Level 1 accredited. New program offerings have also been subjected to preliminary survey visit for the assessment of their readiness for accreditation. Because of Jimsu's rigorous engagement in accreditation endeavors, Jimsu was recognized by AACCUP as top one in the highest number of Level 4 accredited programs in 2020. Top 2 in the highest in number of Level 3 accredited programs in 2020. Top 3 in the highest number of Level 4 accredited programs in 2019. And Top 3 in the highest number of Level 1 accredited programs in 2021. Moreover, the Colleges of Education, Information Technology, and Computer Science are recognized by the Commission on Higher Education as Centers of Development. Jimsu implements strong programs for faculty, staff, and student development. It initiates numerous trainings to upskill and cross-skill, and to equip and empower its 577 faculty members and 514 non-teaching personnel. To provide a quality environment and to ensure quality processes, Jimsu continues to build state-of-the-art infrastructure projects equipped with cutting-edge tools, equipment, and machinery. In fact, Jimsu is already gearing towards becoming a smart university. As a result of quality curriculum, quality processes, and quality academic environment, 
Jimsu has been producing quality graduates who are among the most preferred graduates in the Philippines and abroad. What's more, Jimsu maintains excellent performances in various licensure examinations. In fact, Jimsu ratings in licensure examinations are much higher than that of the national passing rates. For the past several years, Jimsu has produced top notchers in national board examinations in the fields of mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, agriculture, fisheries, agricultural engineering, veterinary medicine, forestry, teacher education, psychology, guidance and counseling, midwifery, and master electrician. What's more, as surveyed by the Commission on Higher Education in 2001, Dimsu ranked among the top 10 higher education institutions in the Philippines and seventh among the more than a thousand private and public colleges and universities in the Philippines. Areas evaluated were faculty, student admission, library, academic offerings, research and extension. Dimsu was also listed in the CHED 2011 to 2016 roadmap for public higher education reform as one of the 19 leading state universities and colleges in the Philippines. As for research, Jimsu's research program is one of the biggest programs in northern Luzon in terms of the number of ongoing research undertaken and budget allocation. Its research commodities include fiber crops, fruit crops, beef and chevin, pork, orchids, bamboo, agroforestry, poultry, agricultural engineering, farming system, Applied Rural Sociology, Macroeconomics, Purple Yam, Bananas, Sericulture, and Apiculture. In fact, Dimsu has recently been named by DOST PCAARRD as Top Intellectual Property Filer. Meanwhile, extension programs of the university are anchored in commodity-based services that create an impact on the life of the clientele in terms of productivity, profitability, and services for the enhancement of local government and non-government organizations. Dimsu Technopinoy, also known as Farm Information and Technology Services or FITS has been named by the Philippine Council for Agriculture, Aquatic and National Resources Research and Development as one of the country's active and functional centers. Kapihan Sudimsu, an extension program which is aired online, has also been reaching thousands of clientele. Acknowledged for its distinct competence, expertise and resources, Jimsu is home to a number of special projects. These include the Sericulture Research and Development Institute or SRDI, the National Apiculture Research Training and Development Institute or NARTDI, Fisheries Research and Training Institute or FRTI, Jimsu Pig Extension and Research Farm or DPERF, and the Philippine Carabao Center or PCC. The Affiliated Non-Conventional Energy Center, the Metal Crafts and Innovation Center, and the Agri-Aqua Technology Incubation Center. At present, the university is sprawled on a 1,120-hectare land area, cozily splintered in seven major units. The Central Administration, the National Apiculture Research Training and Development Institute, the Sericulture Research and Development Institute, the North Lonian Campus, the Mid Lonian Campus, the South Lonian Campus, and the Open University System. True to its goal of transforming human resources into productive, self reliant citizens and responsible leaders, Jimsu takes pride in its commitment in fulfilling its vital role in the country's national development. Good afternoon, everyone. I think we have an introduction of the Sorry, it's on my time. Okay, again, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the International Lectures Series in English Educational Studies Program for Language Department Organized by the Joint Partnership of University of CGRI Simara and Don Mariano Market Memorial School University. I am Santara Gandhi, the Adventure, your host moderator for this session. So this afternoon, we are going to hear two amazing lectures on the topic of systematic functional grammar and a few English. 
I know that like me are also you are also invited to hear and listen from our team lectures. But before we start, may I remind everyone of the following um steps to this podcast. One is to please keep their microphone on mute so not to discuss both of the lectures and the participants. Also, we are encouraging you to keep your comments open so that this uh, live stream, this lecture will be more participative. And third, you can keep notes of your questions during the lecture and submit them on the comment section that we have, and then we are going to answer them after both of the lectures. So, let us now open the program to the holidays, be followed by the Philippine National Anthem and the National Anthem of Indonesia. Please give your attention to the ABC.
Again, good afternoon, everyone, and I welcome you again to this international lecture series in English Education Studies program in the language department organized by the joint partnership of TGIR Sumara mm -hmm. and Osana Yano Marcus Memorial State University. There will be a lecture for the students, and we are going to have the first two stories today. But before we meet the first lecture room, let us first hear a message from the Dean of the Faculty of Languages and Arts Education of Universidad Tigar I Simara, Dr. Nathan Oder. Good afternoon. Yes, good afternoon. Excuse me, Ma'am uh, Sintara, probably uh, from Dimsu will give opening speech. Dr. Hadwell, please. So I think we are going to see you later from soon. Let's start first with Dr. Harata. A message from the Director of International Relations and Languages of San Mariano Marcus Memorial State University. Dr. Jesus Rasa Albi Harata, please. Sir Harata, are you here right now? Okay, I think Sir Harata is not still in. Um, I'll check on the technical plate. So, I guess we can move forward then to the first lecture for today, and then we will be having the meeting. After the first lecture, will that be okay, um, ma'am? I think it is. So, although we are very excited to hear from up here, from the representative of. Okay, Mr. Hadat is already here. Okay. So again, may I call on on the spotlight to give a short message, Dr. Rafael, uh, Jesus Rafael Harata, the Director for Internationalization and Languages from Don Mariano Marcos Memorial State University. Sir so Harata, good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Um, yeah. Uh, Ma'am Sintara, uh, is this the Sir, your audio is a bit weak. Okay, could you hear me? Could you hear me? You're a bit weak, but yes, we can hear you for. <clears throat> I'll just use a headset. Sorry. All right, could you hear me? Yes, yes we can hear you. Okay. Uh, uh, Ma'am Sinara, sorry, I just came in. Um, is this for the opening remarks? I think your microphone is on mute again. I think we are experiencing some difficulties with the connection right now. So. Uh, Sir Rata, may we call you on the spotlight for the opening remarks? Ah, okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, I'm so sorry because I just okay, came sir. in. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Mom Sintara, for the introduction. And I would also like to welcome and uh, greet our friends from the 
uh, Universitas PJRI Simarang, our partner in Indonesia. And um, Dimsu is actually very happy and honored and privileged to have been given the opportunity to be with our Indonesian and our Filipino friends uh, for this international collaborative effort involving uh, the Don Mariano Marcos Memorial State University and uh, uh, Universitas PGRI Simarang in Indonesia. Um, our occasion today is uh, yet another example of how Dimsu, our university in the Philippines, is enhancing its international reputation and visibility through the strong uh, trust of our internationalization and linkaging strategy framework and by expanding our engagements leading to exceptional global opportunities for cross-border uh, cross mobility just like this. <clears throat> uh, we believe that uh, developing institutional linkages such as this international lecture series can actually enrich, um, enrich everybody who are involved uh, those students, the faculty members, the teachers who are involved in this uh, in this project. So thank you, Upgris. Uh, thank you, Dr. Noor, for always maintaining the professional relationships with DIMSU. And we thank you for believing in our world-class capabilities for instruction, research, and uh, community services. Our Filipino students, and I'm sure also the Indonesian students, will have the opportunity, uh, will have the, the best opportunity to learn uh, English communication subjects um, uh, the best way that we could, no? And I wish for a fruitful de uh, deliberations, collaborations during this international lecture series um, in, math, in, in in communication and languages. Magandang hapon, magandang tanghali, po Chris and Dimsu, mabuhay po tayong lahat. <laughs> Do we still have okay? So I'm going to now ask for a representative from the cities also to give a message. Okay, sir, so, uh, Dr. Elgar is here right now with us. I think he can give a message. Okay, Dr. Kathleen Elgar. Yeah. May I now call on the spotlight, the Dean of the Faculty of Languages and Arts Education of Universitas CGRI Silara, Dr. Nathan Odor, for a message. Hello. Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. <laughs> Very good afternoon to all uh, present in this occasion. Uh, respected uh, Dr. Hartwell, Norman and Mirza, uh, Dean of uh, Languages Department, and Mr. Jesus. Rafael. Jesus, yeah? Rafael. Rafael, yeah, Mr. Rafael. Sir, Sir Rafael. Oh, Sir Rafael Bicarata, uh, as the coordinator of international lecture series yeah, from uh, Don Mariano Marcos uh, Memorial State University in the Philippines. Uh, Dr. Nur Hidayat, head of uh, Ukris International Office. My colleague, Dr. Jafar Sotik, MPD. Uh, and as as the one of uh, the lecture right now who would like to uh, present uh, his paper uh, and, uh, yeah mr jafar sutik is the head of the center for education and humanities studies yeah of upgris uh, distinguished guests uh, my dear students and ladies and gentlemen um well very good afternoon uh, today, we all yeah, have gathered in uh, the first session of the International Lecture Series Program. Uh, the International Lecture Series Program is an international lecture activity uh, here at UGRIS, yeah, is facilitated by International Office yeah, of UGRIS for students uh, by involving partner universities. Yeah, uh, One of uh, our universities is 
uh, Don uh, Mariano Marcos Memorial State University in uh, the Philippines. This program aims to uh, develop students in science about international perspective, yeah, at least on various current issues, uh, especially those related to disi their disciplines uh, uh, they study, as well as providing opportunities for uh, students to open up international collaborations and partnership, yeah, of course. Uh, besides, uh, this program also aims to increase the number of international activities yeah, in the Faculty of Language and Arts uh, Education, yeah, UCRIS, in the framework of uh, MKPM. Yeah, we call it as MKPM. Uh, this is a program for the Ministry of Education, yeah, <clears throat> Merdeka Belajar Campus Merdeka, which will also play a role in improving the quality or level of the study program <laughs> later. Uh, the resource persons for this international lecture series uh, come from uh, two universities, namely UCRIS and also uh, Don uh, Mariano yeah, University. The speakers will present, of course, their topics according to their areas of ex expertise. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they, uh, there would be four sessions yeah, <clears throat> all together in the international lecture series, uh, starting from today, 9 of May, and then uh, will be continued tomorrow. Yeah, The second session uh, on the 10th, yeah, and then the uh, third session would be on 17th of May. And finally, the uh, session four yeah, will, would be on May 24th. Well, in this very first session, uh, two experts are going to uh, have a presentation that, uh, to their active expertise. They are Dr. Jafar Sotik from UCRIS with uh, the topic Understanding Systemic Functional Grammar and its contribution to English language teaching. And of course, uh, Dr. Hartwell uh, from uh, Don Mariano University with embracing the change, yeah, uh, acclimatizing ASEAN English. -ish. Against this, we, we have uh, assembled uh, here to know more about the topic with two uh, eminent pros uh, speakers yeah, lined up for today's lecture. With this brief background, I would uh, welcome our guest, Dr. Hartwell, yeah, Dean of Languages uh, Department of Don Mariano Marcos Memorial State University, and Dr. Jafar Sotik for sharing uh, their views on this per, uh, pertinent uh, subject. Thank you very much for uh, Dr. Hartwell, as well as to Dr. Jafar Sotik. I want all to also welcome our participants uh, uh, who have uh, come here to this meeting. I feel honored to welcome also all the participants for taking part in uh, this important program. Uh, I'm sure that uh, you all will feel enriched with uh, knowledge after completion of this event. I welcome you all again, yeah, once again, uh, to the lecture series and hopefully that you all will have a great time ahead because uh, this will be continued with uh, uh, three other series, yeah, all together. Thank you very much. And <clears throat> on behalf of the Faculty of Language and Arts Education, yeah, I officially open uh, this lecture series by saying Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, see you and enjoy these lectures. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Uh, are there for those wonderful lectures? So before I proceed to the lectures, now that we have heard both of the lectures, also representative from uh, Universidad de Guatemala and Don Mariano Marcos Memorial State University. May I first call everyone to please open their camera so we can have the initial photo opportunity. Uh, mm -hmm.
before we proceed to the lecture proper. Um, currently, we have 88 participants on this Zoom meeting, and we have four panels in the field. Uh, so, uh, may I ask everyone to please open your camera? I can see a few people also in the camera right now. For the open your camera, so we can have a look at the photo opportunity with our representatives. Okay, so let's have. I think it's six two, so I'll count of three. Can you show your most beautiful smile? One, two, three. Okay, on the second panel. One, two, three. Fourth panel. One, two, three. And on the last panel. One, two, three. Okay, anyways, oh, we are still going to have another photo opportunity later. After the lecture. So before we proceed, let us also hear message from that uh, Dr. Nora Kibala from CGRI Sinaran. So. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the time uh, for, me, for me to. Uh, give my short speech on behalf of the International Office of Urtas Begiri Semarang. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to extend my respect to the Dean of uh, Faculty of uh, Science and Humanities of Adimsu. And uh, of course, uh, I would also like to extend my uh, respect to our dean, the dean of faculty of Lang language and science and art of Universitas uh, Uh Also, uh, uh, the presenters of the uh, the first uh, episodes of uh, lecture series today, uh, Dr. Jafar Sodik and Dr. Uh, Artwell, and. Uh, um, Students, uh, lecturers uh, attending uh, the first uh, sessions of the lecture CS program. On behalf of uh, UPS International Office, uh, I would like to say that uh, we are really honored and uh, it's really our great privilege to have the opportunity uh, to collaborate with DIMSU. And uh, today, uh, collaboration marks the uh, fifth year of IMSU and UPS collaborations that we have been collaborating in uh, various uh, different uh, collaborations, ranging from uh, international credit transfers, join uh, international students' conference, uh, lecture series, visiting uh, lectures, and some other collaborations that we have been conducting for the last five years and in the near future uh, this coming semester uh, we have already planned to have another collaborations done that is international credit transfer program another international credit transfer program and uh, we plan to send four students uh, to dimsu for uh, this coming batch of international credit transfer program as well as our engagement uh, at the scene future uh, program. In this case, uh, we plan to send our students to do teaching internships uh, at schools in the uh, Philippines under DIMSU um, uh, co-coordinations. So that's uh, what we have been uh, doing for the last five uh, years. And we are very happy and really honored and uh, so privileged yeah, to have the opportunity for those long uh, partnership. And also, we hope that uh, we could uh, further uh, develop our collaboration with some other uh, collaborations like uh, join uh, research and join the students' publication, uh, probably also in uh, join 
community service and some other collaborations. As we have already understood that uh, internationalization program would benefit uh, the university, either from the lectures level, the uh, students level, the department levels and the faculty levels. And we, uh, hope, uh, we have also understood that uh, the internationalization program would, uh, of course, uh, improve the capacity buildings of uh, our un both university that uh, in the later, uh, later future that, uh, of course, international uh, program would, uh, let's say, improve our uh, university ranking and replacing uh, and some other a benefit of uh, collaborations on internalization program and uh, <clears throat> this i think uh, will be <clears throat> also achieved by uh, a lecture series program in which uh, students and lectures would uh, directly uh, improve the competence yeah, uh, by participating or uh, presenting themselves as speakers in the lecture series program. So uh, we hope that uh, both of our students from uh, our universities will enjoy the lectures and some other speakers uh, and are waiting for the next term of their presentations. Yeah, that would be uh, finished by end of this uh, this month, yeah. Well, uh, I think uh, that's all we could uh, say uh, on behalf of International Asset Program. Again, uh, we are, uh, we would like to say that we are very happy that today's program uh, marks the fifth year of DIMSU and UPRI's uh, uh, internationalization, internationalization uh, collaborations program. And, uh, we are very happy uh, to find that uh, our fifth year collaboration program is still running uh, very well. Yeah. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih, Avani, after Dr. Nuri Hidayat from International Relations Office of Rupees. Now we want to hear also a message from Dr. Hartwell Norman Mirza. Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, Dean of the College of A pleasant day, everyone. Ma'am Sintara, am I audible? Okay, thank you so much. So, again, a pleasant day to everyone. Mabuhay. In the Philippines, we call it Mabuhay. Mm -hmm. Um, Salamat siang. I hope I pronounce oh, it correctly. Yes, yes, that's correct. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. So we are really delighted to welcome everybody, all the students, all our language professors and learners here. We have, I think, 96 and counting. We have more than 100 students and I even required them to really attend this one. Later on, I'll give them a quiz. <laughs> regarding this one. Yeah. Anyway, I am really delighted to welcome you all uh, to this magnificent event, which is the International Lecture Series in English Education Study Program. So we are glad here in the Midla Union Campus. Uh, we are in the middle. We are the heart of the university, Midla Union Campus, the Don Mariano Marcos Memorial State University specifically here in the College of Arts and Sciences. So we are really happy that we are part of this um, education study program because um, nowadays, ISO accreditation, we need internationalization. And this is just a one step for us, for us to be part of the international world, the global world, as we say it, okay? So um, with this collaboration with the Don Mariano Marcos Memorial State University, together with Universitas PGRI Semarang, we are really happy. This is quite rare because we managed to be together. And with this um, study program, we try to learn, we relearn, and we unlearn. Okay, concepts, things, in language education. So we take this event as an opportunity for us language teachers and English language students to deepen our knowledge and understanding 
of the different topics which will be discussed in different uh, sessions later on. Uh, let us all unravel new knowledge, gain sufficient wisdom in this endeavor. So we are really hoping for a good result with this one. And let us enjoy learning. And I, will be, I believe that uh, we should uh, enjoy learning from each other, regardless of our race, regardless of our school, regardless of our religion, regardless of our region, regardless of our language, we learn from each other. So again, thank you so much. Maraming salamat. Asalamu alaikum. Teri makasi. Is that please keep your microphone on mute, especially for the participants, so not to disturb the participants. Second is that we are encouraging everyone to maintain their cameras open to make it this session more interactive. And third, of course, is to take notes of your questions or queries so you can ask them later during the course. So now let's proceed to the most inviting part, I guess. Right, inviting forth to the lecture proper. So let uh, I will now going to be introducing the first lecturer. Our first lecturer had his master's degree at Universitas Negeri Sembilan Indonesia and his doctoral degree at Universitas Sebelas Meret. I'm reading it correctly. Meret, Sukarata, Indonesia, on which he had a very interesting dissertation entitled. Analysis of the translation practice and the exposition text of the book, the 100 most asked questions about love, sex, and relationships. A systematic functional linguistic approach to translation study. He is also consistent in making rotations every year and is currently conducting research related to digital marketing. Through his consistency and active pursuit and research, he currently has four published articles, scientific articles under his name, one of which is entitled, I hope I am going to read this right. Sal-Karakterisasi Toko-Otam Dalam Novel, Bumi Nalisa Karya, Pramadiya Amenta, Tuwer Dalam Versi Bahasa Indonesia, Dan Terjemahan Dalam Bahasa Inggris, This Earth of Mankind. I practice that too. He is currently subject for a second language acquisition. This course is studying systematic function drama on translation. So with all of the bottom the bottom, let us now welcome on the spotlight Dr. Hafar Sadi. Sir. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Good afternoon, uh the moderator. Uh before uh Dr. Dr. Asbun, Dr. Hartwell, and also Dr. Nuryat Dayat leave this session. <laughs> I'd like to say hello to all of you, especially Dr. Hartwell. Yeah. Uh, once I went to Bakuyo <laughs> with Dr. Nuryat Dayat, and uh, I had a chance to visit your campus there. Well, it's such a big campus. And, I think uh, we are all proud to have such a big campus in uh, the Philippines. Uh, I went there in nineteen. Uh, sorry, in two thousand nineteen, before the um, pandemic. pandemic time, <laughs> and so it it was good for me and for us to have the time uh, to visit uh, the team team so campus. Uh, Sir, this is Rafael. Hello. <laughs> Once we met in Paquio. <laughs> uh, uh, Dr. Nuridaya, thank you for, uh, as the Director of International Affairs Office, for uh, the, uh, what, what we call it, for the opportunity for me to uh, share uh, my lecture on uh, systemic functional grammar. Uh, uh, well, I 
think I need some time, uh, some uh, few minutes to prepare my uh, uh, share screen. All right, Magnor, can you see my slide? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Very uh, beautiful <laughs> slides. <laughs> beautiful blue, right? All right, but <clears throat> okay. Uh, systemic functional grammar and English language teaching. Well, actually, I teach systemic functional grammar uh, for the students in the third year. Uh, as we see in the first and second year, or in semester one, two, three, and four, uh, the students in uh, Upgris uh, have taken grammar one, grammar two, grammar three, and grammar four, right? And now in semester six, they are now in semester six, or the end of the third year, uh, they are taking systemic functional grammar. Right, and uh, <clears throat> this this lecture I think is needed for uh, the prospective teachers uh, to know uh, well about English, and so that they will equip them when they uh, help students understand and also produce text, especially when the students have to consider. Uh, in writing or in speaking, the relationship between text and context and the relation between language and the society. And so uh, our, my topic is now, we are going to talk about formal grammar in comparison with the systemic functional grammar. And also uh, one aspect of the systemic functional grammar besides uh, register analysis and then also uh, grammatical system or grammatical label such as transitivity, mood system, and so also theme and rim, and also metafunction or analysis of metafunction. Yeah, uh, this this these aspects of uh, systemic functional grammars are given to my students for one semester. So we uh, we have uh, 15 meetings or 16 uh, included the final test. In this uh, time, about 40 or 45 minutes, I will share one of the aspects of the systemic functional grammar, uh, which is hopefully uh, beneficial for our students. Uh, who are the prospective teachers to help students uh, help their learners, English learners later when they do the English language skills such as reading, listening, writing, and also speaking. And the last topic will be uh, the contribution to the English language teaching. And this uh, special moment, I'll uh, relate the understanding of systemic functional grammar with uh, the teaching of writing, uh, writing text, especially uh, descriptive text. All right. Uh, as a lecture, I use two main books, two main textbooks for the reference for my students. One is Making Sense of Functional Grammar, written by uh, Jared and Wignall, and also Working with Functional Grammar, written by Jim Martin and also Professor uh, Christian Mathiesen. Yeah. Uh, all right, uh, students, uh, we, we are uh, going to view uh, uh, the formal grammar, yeah, the grammar so far, which you have been studying, you have been learning in semester one, semester two, three, and four. Uh, we call it uh, basic grammar, 
uh, intermediate grammar and also pre-advanced grammar and also uh, advanced grammar. Yeah, uh, uh, we need we need to learn a grammar as an prospect as a prospective teacher uh, as uh, the students of the English language education study program. Yeah. Uh, in the past, when Pak Nur Hidayat and I studied together, there are uh, five, five uh, lectures on grammar, if I'm not mistaken. Five or, yes, five grammars, five uh, lectures on grammar, six lectures on writing, six lectures on reading uh, comprehension. <laughs> uh, but now uh, it seems to me that the the materials or the lessons on grammar uh, seem to be fewer than uh, it was in the past. So because there are only one grammar one, grammar two, and grammar three and grammar four. Yeah, uh, English grammar is uh, one of the language elements and needed, uh, required to understand the lang English language. Uh, grammar, vocabulary, and pronunciation, and also um, uh, pronunciation and spelling. Yeah, those four element, uh, language elements are important. Uh, but uh, concerning with uh, using the language, uh, language skills are more important, such as listening, writing, speaking, and also reading. All right. Uh, we need to know the theory of grammar because uh, uh, it helps uh, us understand how text works. Yeah, for teachers, for teachers, and for you, all the students who are prospective teachers, you need to know uh, the theory of grammars because you will need them to to help your students understand and produce text. Yeah, understand and produce text well or appropriately. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, formal grammar. Yes, formal grammar, as the name implies, it is concerned with forms. Yeah, concerned with forms. And the type or the characteristics of the formal grammars is prescriptive. Yeah. It means that uh, we uh, use the rules or patterns according to uh, the Latin language. And, and so the, we focus on rules for producing correct sentences. Yeah. Concern to describe the structure of individual sentences. So when, when we see sentences, number one, two, and three, if we, if we are concerned with uh, formal grammar, Right, with uh, concern with from formal grammar. So the question will be, the question will be about the grammatical structures, such as the plural or singular markers, yeah, Sing, uh, plural markers, singular markers, subject verb agreement, and also tenses. So you see, if I give you sentence number one, clause number one, the students learn the sentence patterns. So we are concerned with the plural markers. Students learn agreement between subject and predicate and, and the verbs. Oh, yes, that's correct. And the sentence patterns. Yeah, uh, the, there is a definite, definite article, the sentence patterns and plural markers. Yeah. What about sentence number two? A man needs a woman. Well, a man needs a woman. Have a look at this clause. A man needs a woman. Yes, since the subject is a man, then the predicate or the verbs uh, need the singular marker as needs and then a woman. Yeah, okay. Uh, the sentence is grammatical. Yeah, the sentence is, is, is grammatical. We also we can also exchange the subject and the object here. For example, a woman needs a man, for example, right? And we are not talking about what if there is no indefinite article a. Uh, yeah, a man needs women. <laughs> yeah, we don't we we don't talk about uh, the content or the relationship between the text and the context. 
between the language and also the social context or the genre of the thing, right? Number three, God created the universe. Yes, the concept uh, about God creation happened in the past. And so we use the tenses, the tense, uh, simple past yet. God created the universe. Finish. Stop. Yeah. There is no relation with uh, the present situation and therefore we use simple past tense. Yeah. Uh, the case will be different if God has created the universe and then it is in the simple present future, uh, simple present perfect and so there is a relationship with the now situation. Yeah, that is uh, the business in formal grammar. Right. Now, in functional grammar, which is descriptive in nature, yeah, uh, we describe the language in actual use. Yeah, in actual use. So, uh, how language functions to create meaning? How language functions to make meaning? Uh, yeah, Th this is what we we are learning in systemic functional grammar. So, we view language as a resource for making meaning. So, the focus is on text and the, their relations to the context. So, we are not anymore talking about plural, singular, tense, tenses, and then verb agreements. No, not because they are not needed, but because uh, this is these are the prerequisites for us to learn the systemic functional grammar. Yeah, the, so the structural grammar, structural grammars which are uh, many in English language, uh, are supposed to have been mastered by our all the students. So, uh, for my students in semester six, uh, uh, I'm sure that all all the students have mastered the concept of the grammar. So we do not uh, review even uh, those um, the mastery of those uh, grammatical structures. Yeah, our concern, our concern is on how the text relates to the context. Yeah. But of course, uh, we also concern on how those structures yeah, construct meaning, all right? Yes. Next, uh, one of the important, one of the important uh, aspect in the study of the systemic functional grammar, as I mentioned in the first uh, in the first part of my uh, lecture, is metafunctions. Yeah, the term metafunction originates from the systemic functional linguistics. So systemic functional linguistics, and then uh, systemic functional grammar, and and then we are talking about the exercises and the systemic functional grammar. So, uh, systemic functional grammar, which is derived from systemic functional linguistics, views language as functional and semantic rather than formal and syntactic, rather than the concern on the forms and also the syntax or the patterns of the sentence. Right? Yes. Uh, it is said by Professor Martin and Matthias that all languages vary in how and what they do, but all are shaped and organized in relation to three functions. Yeah, three functions that every clause plays. Yeah, three functions that every clause in English plays. Yeah, since the functions are beyond the clauses, and so it is called metafunctions. Yeah. Metafunction, function the language place beyond the wordings. Yes. So, for example, sentence like, I love you. So we do not, uh, we do not uh, talk about subject I, and then sub, uh, verb love, and then object you, but we are concerned with what situation, what idea, what message, so that we represent the message into the class like, I love you. Yeah, I love you. And 
why uh, subject I is put at the beginning, not you yeah. is in the first part. So yeah. you are loved by me. Yeah, those are the concern of the systemic functional grammar. All right. Uh, to talk about meta function, we first uh, should uh, uh, know that clauses are the simplest units of analysis in systemic functional grammar. Uh, if, if, we, if, we, uh, if we talk about uh, uh, plural or singular and then talk about tenses, yeah, we talk about the elements or components of a clause. Yes. But in systemic functional grammar, our simplest unit of analysis is the clause. And then we go to larger construction like paragraph or clause complex. Yeah, first clause and then high. Dr. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. I lost I lost contact and now I seem to be back. Yes, sir, you are back. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But Dr. Nasbun, can can you see my slide? Yes. 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 Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you, Pak Hasbun. Kuota, kuota use habis, of for several seconds, ya. Yeah. Yeah. Use of for several seconds. Ya, yeah, kuota habis. Saya tadi pakai <laughs> uh, my own uh, okay. Okay, uh, mobile. Okay, all right. Yes, uh, inter interpersonal meaning, interpersonal uh, meaning, and also textual meaning or meta function. All right. <clears throat> yeah. Next. Uh, yeah, clause is the simplest unit of analysis, and each clause expresses or encodes three meanings simultaneously: interpersonal meaning, ideational meaning, and textual meaning. All right, I'll, be, I'll repeat: our simplest unit of analysis in systemic functional grammar is clause, and every clause in English expresses three meanings simultaneously, interpersonal, ideational, and textual, right? 
uh, what is ideational meaning, what is interpersonal meaning, and what is textual meaning. Yeah, interpersonal meaning is concerned with what the speaker wants to do or wants to act with the text or clause, right? Yeah, that is called the interpersonal meaning. What the speaker or the writer wants to do with the text. Yeah, if we do something with our bodily organs, we are standing, we are clapping, we are running, we are working, walking, but with text, we are informing, requesting, introducing, asking someone to do something, uh, asking for information, yeah, thanking, complimenting, yeah, that, those are the interpersonal meaning, right? Yeah, the second, ideational meaning is concerned with how text or clause represents the world experience of phenomena. Yeah, how the clause represents the idea. Yeah, yeah you, you see, the idea is about the happening. So someone is running, someone is walking, someone is sitting, someone is listening. Yeah, we represent the phenomena such as someone is walking, someone is running, someone is uh, sitting into text, yeah. All right? Into text. If it is a habit, then the text should be in the present simple. If it is in progress, the text should be in the present continuous. And so, the focus is on how the subject and then predicate and then object and then the situation. Subject, predication, and then situation or location. Yeah. So that is the business in ideational meaning. So if there is a text like this. My father is a teacher, is an English teacher, and then we can express it or represent it into my father teaches English. Yes, the situation is that my father every day teaches English. So I express this in my father is an English teacher, okay. All right? So whether you want to write my father is an English teacher or my father teaches English, yeah, it depends on the situation. Whether you want to talk about action or you want to talk about uh, the fact. The fact is that my father is a teacher. Yeah, this is, this is called ideational meaning of a clause. And then number three, textual meaning is concerned with the organization of the text or clause the organization of text or clause to relate to the context. So, for example, in this, a descriptive text, which is talk about, which is uh, about my mother. So my mother should always uh, be in the beginning. My mother, mm, uh, she is, mm, her room is, nah, uh, what we put first and then next in the clause is the business of textual meaning, right? The organization of the clause of the text so that the text relate to the context relevantly, all right? If we talk about my father, so my father should be in front, in the beginning, should be put at the beginning of the clause. If it is a paragraph, should be put in the first sentence of the paragraph, right? And then followed by another sentence or another clause. All right, this, uh, this is the textual meaning of a text. So now let's see. Example clause one. Example clause one. Yeah, what does the speaker want to do in each of these clauses? Yeah, that is the business of interpersonal meaning, right? 
and has breakfast at six. What does the writer want to say? And has breakfast at six. Yes, the writer wants to give information. Give information. And so it is called statement, right? The interpersonal meaning is statement. <coughs> what about text number two? Does N have breakfast at six? What is the speaker's intention when she writes? Does N has have breakfast at six? <coughs> yes. The writer wants information. All right. The writer wants to get information. To get information. Want to get information is called question. All right? Yes. So the interpersonal meaning of clause number two is question. Questioning. Okay. <coughs> number three. Please have breakfast at six. Please has, have breakfast at six. What is the interpersonal meaning? All right. Yeah. Give instruction, ordering, commanding, giving instruction. And so this clause is called a comment, an order, right? And the action is called ordering or commanding. All right. Number four. Never eat. Sorry, never eat more than two eggs a day. Never eat more than two eggs a day. What does the writer want to do with this text? All right. Yes. Uh, the writer, <clears throat> the writer um, asks someone not to do something. Asking someone not to do something. What is it called in English? If asking someone to do something is called requesting. If asking someone not to do something in Indonesian language, melarang, larangan. What is in English? Come on. Come on, what is in English? Asking someone not to do something. Okay, yes, okay, warning is okay, yeah. Uh, uh, reminding someone to do some, not to do something, okay. So in the interpersonal meaning of clause number four is Warning or reminding someone. All right. Now let's see. Let's go on to the second uh, meta function. Ideational meaning. Yes, the ideational meaning. See, do the pair of clauses express the same idea or message? My question is, do the pair of clauses here express the same idea or message or ideal meaning? Ideational meaning. All right. Let's see. Pairs. Pair number one, and has breakfast at six, and eats breakfast at six. All right? Are they about the same meaning? Yes. But you see, there is a difference in expressing, in representing about having breakfast, about eating breakfast between clause A and also clause B, all right? Then uh, clause pair number two, I speak Japanese at home. I speak Japanese at home. I speak Filipino at home. And compare with clause B, I use Japanese at home. Are they about the same meaning? Are they about the same meaning? Yes, I think so. But 
the representation of the idea about using English, using Javanese, using Filipino, or speaking Javanese, speaking Filipino, makes it different, all right? So uh, the additional meaning of clause 2A and clause 2B are different, right? Now let's go on to number three. Miss Lee is an English teacher. Miss Lee teaches English, all right? Yes, as with clause one and clause number two, yeah, clause is number one A and number one B and also number one, uh, number two A and number two B. Well, I think uh, one is more appropriate than the other, all right? One is more appropriate than the other. And it is called appropriate or grammatical. Yeah, it is called appropriate or in, in the terms of English grammar, it is called grammatical. So number one, A is more grammatical than, than B. All right, because native speaker of English will say, has breakfast instead of eats breakfast. Yeah. Also, although the accent is putting food into our mouth, it's called eating, right? Yeah, it's called eating. But in English expression, in English representation, the more grammatical in systemic functional grammar is number one A. Number two, Number 2A is also more grammatical than B, right? And what about number three? Which is more appropriate? Which is more grammatical in our business here? Well, it depends. It depends. Uh, there is the verb is here, and also the verb teaches in, in uh, number 3B. In number one, the clause uses 2B, but in number two, the clause uses verbs. All right, verb, teach, teaches. Uh, which is grammatical? In formal grammar, the two clauses are all grammatical, but in systemic functional grammar, it depends on the context. Yeah, the text should be related to the context. If there is a question, what is Miss Lee? And then the answer will be Miss Lee is an English teacher. But to the question, what does Miss Lee do? What does Miss Lee do? All right, Miss Lee teaches English. All right. But we still we still say or speak uh, uh, this idea, uh, this idea about English teacher or English teaching with various construction in English, yeah? With various English construction. So for example, when I ask you, what is Miss Lee? We can answer using P, Miss Lee teaches English. What does Miss Lee do? Miss Lee is an English teacher. But of course, one is more grammatical than the other. It depends on the context. If the context does know is uh, the context does know is um, uh, what is it? Uh, the question. The context is the question. What is Miss Lee? And then three A is more appropriate or more grammatical. All right. Now let's see the last the last uh, meta function textual meaning. Look at the pair of clauses here. Notice a difference in the topic or theme of each clause. The topic or theme of this clause. And it is the business of textual meaning. It is concerned with textual meaning. Good. Okay, number one. Mom serves our breakfast early. 
mom serves our breakfast early. Okay, mom is underlined. And so this is the theme of the clause. This is the topic of discussion, right? What about number two? Our breakfast is served early by mom. Our breakfast is served early by mom. Well, I'm sure, yes, I'm certain that sentence uh, clause A and clause B are about the same message, right? The same message about the same meaning, yes? It's about mom serves our breakfast or our breakfast is served by mom. But in terms of textual meaning, the organization of the clause, we can say that A is more grammatical than B, depending on the context. Yeah, if we are talking about our mother, my mother is, my mother is very diligent. She serves our breakfast every day, all right? Yeah. But if we talk about our mother, but my mother, our mother, and then we produce cross P, our breakfast is served by my mom. Yeah, that is not grammatical, right? And the textual meaning or the textual meta function must be revised, all right? If we are talking about our mom, then mom should be put first in the clause. But if we talk about things at home, for example, my room, um, my bedroom, and then my bike, um, my breakfast is served by mom. All right? Yeah. So sentence B, clause B is more, more grammatical. Grammatical in the textual meaning or in the textual meta function. All right. Now number two, two A. Japan makes Honda. B, Honda is made in Japan. Or in the context of the Philippines, Photon is manufactured in the Philippines. All right? The Philippines manufactures Photon. Is that correct, uh, Ms. Sindara? <laughs> yeah? All right, the, uh, the Philippines makes photon or class B, photon is made in the Philippines. Yeah, in formal grammar, the two clauses are grammatical, but in systemic functional grammar, one is not grammatical and the other is grammatical depending on the context, all right? depending on the context. If we talk about those countries like Japan, Indonesia, the Philippines, German, Germany, and then Italy and United States of America, they all make vehicles. Japan makes Honda, Italy makes Ferrari, all right? Yeah. Um, America makes uh, Ford, for example. Yeah, that is grammatical. But if we are talking about kinds of vehicle like Honda, Toyota, Ferrari, Suzuki is made in Japan. Honda is made in Japan, all right? Yeah, this is the example of textual meaning. Textual meaning is the organization of the text, which is put where? Yeah, which is put where? And the first part is called the theme or the topics of the clause. Okay, then number two. Uh, the level of the the level of the clause is under the level of clause complex. And so uh, the textual meaning is not only applied in the level of clause, but also on the level of clause complex and also on the level of paragraph and the higher construction. So as with clauses number one, 
complex, sorry, as with complex clause number 3A, I open the window because it is hot. All right. I open the window because it is hot. So you see, okay, oh, you see, uh, there is a clause at the beginning and another clause at the end, which is put in front or which is put at the beginning is the business of textual metafunction, all right? I open the window because it is hot. Or number two, P or three P, it is hot here, so I open the window. Yeah. It is hot here, so I open the window. If if the context, yeah, so if the context is about uh, the everyday situation or temperature or climate, so we say it is hot here, so I open. The window. Huh? <coughs> All right. If we talk about, if we talk about uh, our daily activity, uh, I open the window every day because it is hot here in Indonesia. And so, uh, then clause complex number one is more grammatical than clause number two. But if we talk about our climate here. Clause 3B is more grammatical than clause 3A. All right. Okay, those are uh, the discussion of uh, meta functions, uh, those functions, three functions interpersonal, ideational, and textual. Yeah, with a clause simultaneously expresses with a clause and quotes simultaneously at the same time, all right? Okay, is there any question? Hello, is there any question? So, sir, there is no currently any posted question on the current section, but if Anyone among our participants have any questions, you can use again the chat box or you can use the I can use the raise hand button we have here in the chat. Okay. There's no question yet. Okay, no question. All right. Now let's yes, well actually as a lecture, uh, Ms. Sindara has a lecture. Uh, we will discuss in depth, right? Interpersonal meta functions and then uh, um, ideational meta function with their uh, grammatical labels, uh, grammatical system, and also textual uh, meta function with uh, the aspects and also the grammatical labels, right? But uh, here, uh, since we uh, we have only forty five minutes, all right, to Ms. Indara, and so we will go on to the last part of our uh, last part of our <coughs> uh, material, all right? Yeah. Okay. Let's see a descriptive text here. Yeah. Uh, descriptive text here. All right, everybody, please look at this uh, descriptive uh, text. Yeah, descriptive talk text as a text to describe something, text to describe person, animal, to describe thing, to describe a place. And then we will see, we will analyze. Yeah, based on the meta function analysis that we have just been doing with. Uh, those uh, example clauses, yeah, yeah, at the, the beginning of our uh, slides. All right, yes. <clears throat> Let's see the de this descriptive text. My bunny. I have a male rabbit. My bunny has four little cute feet. He likes to jump to my bed. His ears are long, and they like to cover his chubby cheeks. 
His fur is brown. And unlike other rabbits, my bunny's favorite food is banana. Whenever I eat a banana, he will run and jump to me so he can take a bite. All right. I have a male rabbit. Yeah. My rabbit or my bunny has four little cute feet. He likes to jump to my bed. His ears are long and they like to cover his chubby cheeks. His fur is brown. And unlike other rabbits, my bunny's favorite food is banana. Whenever I eat a banana, he will run and jump to me and so he can take a bite. All right. Yeah. Let's do the analysis of the meta function. All right. Number one, interpersonal meta function analysis. What the writer wants to do with the text. Since it is a descriptive text, it is sure that the writer wants to describe. Yeah, want to describe. This is a descriptive text, a text to describe persons, animals, things, or places. So to describe the clauses must be in declarative mood. Yeah. The, the clauses must be in declarative mood, subject, uh, finite, predication, complement, and agent. Yeah, look at, have a look. Subject, predicator, complement. Subject, predicator, complement. Subject, predicator, complement. Yes, they are all in declarative or positive sentences. Yeah, because we want to describe something. If we want to discuss, then we compare. If we want to uh, express opinion, we do it in exposition, right? But because it is a descriptive text, so the writer wants to describe things here. Describe anima, describe my bunny, okay? Yes, the simple present tense is used to describe condition, facts, or habits, yeah, facts or habits or usual condition, and then we use the sample, simple present tense, okay? Yeah, simple present tense because it is a description. All right, that is the the interpersonal meta function analysis. What about ideational meta function? Okay, now let's see, let's see several clauses here. He likes to jump to my bed. He likes to jump to my bed. The same clause, you can say, he often jumps to my bed. He usually jumps to my bed. You see, instead of likes to jump, we can use he often jumps to my bed, okay? He often jumps to my bed. It's the same with he likes to jump to my bed. What about number two? His ears are long. Well, actually, in English, you can say, you can say he has long ears. Yeah, that is more English. Yeah, that is more English. Then his ears are long. Yeah, you see, you see when you describe yourself, my hair is black instead of I have black hair. Her hair is blonde instead of she has blonde hair, which is correct in English. All right, the second sentence or the second clause is correct grammatically. Grammatical in ideational meta function. All right. Yes. This these two clauses are grammatical, but in systemic functional grammar, one is more grammatical than the other. All right. <clears throat> what about number next next clause? My bunny's favorite food is banana. Okay. Using is here. Yeah, this clause uses, uses in, uh, is here. 
how we can say this? Yeah. My bunny likes banana very much. Okay. Yeah. Instead of using is, you can use likes, which has the same or similar meaning. My bunny's favorite food is banana. My bunny's my bunny likes banana very much. Okay, then the last, the last one. Yeah, okay, for example. So he can take a bite or he can bite a bit. Well, I think the first clause is more grammatical in English in terms of ideational meaning. Ya, yang pertama ini lebih grammatical daripada yang kedua karena this is normally said or this is normally written by native speaker of English. So, ideational meaning is similar to what the native speakers of English normally write or normally say. Okay, the last one, textual metafunction. The last one, textual metafunction analysis, how the text is organized or what or which is put where. Okay, the theme is my bunny. So all clauses describe about the bunny. My bunny, he, his, mm, they, yeah, their, their ears, they. So all are about my bunny. So in terms of textual metafunction analysis, my bunny or the pronoun of bunny such as he or the possessive uh, his must be put at the beginning of the clauses in the text. Okay, then there is a connection between clauses. Yeah, there is a connection between clauses. Okay, look at this. If we make it into, if we make the text into uh, sentences in number, number one, I have a male rabbit. Number two, my bunny has four little cute feet. Ma number three, he likes to jump to my bed. Number four, his ears are long and so on. Until number 10, every clause in each text are connected to each other. Yeah, there is a connection between clauses. Using about what? Using conjunction and whenever or so. Yeah, okay. Yeah, this is called textual metafunction analysis. Well, I hope if everybody, all of you can do the analysis of metafunction to the student work, to students writing work, for example. Well, I think uh, your students can produce better text. Right? Yeah, that's all for my lecture this afternoon. Thank you, Ms. Sitara. Yeah. Terima kasih um, atas kuliah yang luar biasa, Dr. Hafar. Thank you very much um, for the reminder that context one, meta function analysis can also be done for students first. Of course, I said the bun is monkey. And not a bunny. <laughs> so <Yeah>. again, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Our next okay. Lecture. Remind everyone that if you have note of the section or utilize the raise hand button, lead to having our QA session. So I think we, we are now also ready to listen to our second. Equally competent speaker. So let me introduce to you our second speaker, who is also after how far this is competent, a graduate um had a graduate degree on master's of arts and education and a postgraduate degree on doctor of education. He is also currently taking his second postgraduate degree on philosophy and language teaching. He also presented the research paper. At national and 
international conferences that help several to lift our people in their notes under his team. He uh, six public books on subjects such as English for academic purposes, purpose of communication, text with text in English, and is now through, uh, and has served as uh, speakers, speakers at national and international conferences, seminars, trainings. He also serves, or currently is serving as the director of international cross cultural exchange and professional development Thailand, and during being of the College of Arts and Sciences at Don Mariano Marcos Memorial State University, Mid La Union campus. So again, with your react button, let us now welcome on the spotlight, Dr. Hartwell Norma M. Rosa. Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon, Ma'am Sintara. Thank you so much. I I hope I'm audible, Ma'am Sintara. I'm yes. audible. Yes. Okay. Yes. audible. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you for your lecture, Dr. Jafar. Oh, I hope we can you. get a copy of your presentation so <laughs> yeah, that we okay. can also share that to our students later on. Okay. Thank you so much. It was a very informative um, discussion about, of course, a grammar with Dr. Jafar. Thank you so much, Dr. Jafar. Okay. You are welcome, so, sir. I'll be discussing. Okay, thank you, sir. So I'll be discussing today um, something like uh, I'll check my my presentation first. Okay, so I'll be discussing something. Probably it's not new to others, but I want to acclimatize some students and teachers, especially our English teachers, with regard to my presentation today. So I, I was given only 45 minutes. So I will try my best to give you the 45 minutes because even Dr. Jafar would say that 45 minutes is not enough, right, Sir Jafar? So, <laughs> yeah, 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 um, yeah. Um, however, we will try our best. I will try my best regarding my presentation. So this, I'll try to, I'm sharing now my presentation. I Okay. Is it visible now, Ma'am ma Sitara? Okay. Yes. <clears throat> yes. So yes, sir. It is. Okay. So I am Hartwell Norman Mirza, the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences here in Don Mariano Marcos Memorial State University, Medla Union Campus. So I'll be discussing to you um, this uh, topic, embracing the change, acclimatizing ASEAN English. So um, some would pronounce that one as ASEAN, ASEAN, Asian, whatever is the pronunciation, as long as you know it, that's correct. Okay, so embracing the change, acclimatizing ASEAN Englishes. So the scope of our discussion for this hour is that what is ASEAN or what is ASEAN? And then the second one, I'll be introducing to you about um, world Englishes. So unlike before, we do not pluralize the word English, but now we are pluralizing it already because we have a lot of Englishes already. Okay, unlike before. Okay, next we have um, ASEAN Englishes. So what is ASEAN Englishes or ASEAN Englishes? And then fourth, I'll be just giving you um, a glimpse about Indonesian English. Um, probably some of our Indonesian friends there, our teachers, our language learners know a little bit about the Indonesian English or you know more about the Indonesian English. And of course, I'll be discussing a little bit of the Philippine English. So you brace yourself for 45 minutes. I'll be discussing these five topics. Okay. So the first one is let's try to define what is ASEAN. So what is ASEAN or ASEAN? So stands for Association of Southeast Asian Nations. So it's an acronym. It is a regional intergovernmental organization consisting of 10 member countries in Southeast Asia. So originally there are 10, but now there are more than 10 already. Okay, so originally we have Brunei, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam. So Philippines and Indonesia are part of this ASEAN. So it was founded on August 8, in 1967 with the signing of the Bangkok Declaration. So it happened in, uh, Sing uh, in Thailand before. So these are the different flags 
of the ASEAN nation. So that's ASEAN. And we are all part of this one. Okay. Let's go to the next. So I am presenting you today World Standard English by MacArthur in 1987. So actually, in 1987, we already have the circle of world Englishes or world English, meaning we don't have, uh, it's not about American English anymore. It's not just about British English anymore, but we have a lot of Englishes already. Okay, wait, I have to go back there. Okay, so world standard English. So as you can see, by region, we have um, Englishes. Like we have the East Asian Standardizing English. We're in Philippine English. Our Philippine English is here. We have Singaporean English. And then we also have the uh, South um, Asian Standard English, wherein you can find here the Sri Lankan English, the Burmese English, the Indian English. And we have there the Australian or New Zealand and South Pacific Standard English. So composed of the following, New Zealand, Australia, okay? And then we have there still on the right part, we have the British and Irish Standard English. Of course, you know, Prince Charles was uh, uh, given the coronation already. So they are part of this uh, British Irish Standard English. We are from the Scottish English, English, um, British English, the BBC, more or less the United Kingdom English. And then we have the very popular, the American Standard English. So from South, the Northern, the Black English vernacular, everything is in there. We also have the Canadian English. We have the Caribbean Standard English. And the last one here, we have the West, East, and Southern African Standardizing English. So as you can see here, it's not just about the focus on the British English, but oh, not, not on the British English, not on the American English, but it focuses on different Englishes. So don't say that my English as an American is the standard way. No, don't tell that anymore because we are embracing this change and this change is to accept other Englishes. Okay, so let's continue. So this is the... Uh, Three concentric circles of Englishes. Okay. When you say concentric Englishes, uh, circles of Englishes, how English was managed to be spoken by a certain country or race. So in the inner circle below it, when you say inner circle, we have the USA, the UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. More or less, it is their first language. That's why they are called the inner circle. Their first language is English. And the, in the outer circle, we have here Bangladesh, Kenya, Pakistan, Philippines, Malaysia, and other countries here. This is their second language. Okay. And then we have the expanding circle. Okay. When you say expanding circle, meaning these countries are still trying to embrace English, although they already embrace English, but not totally yet. Okay, so we have China, Indonesia is part here, Korea, including South and North Korea. We have Egypt, Nepal, and Taiwan and other countries there. So let's try to check the, the differences here. Okay, let's go to the next slide. We have here the inner circle consists of countries where English is their primary language. That's why it's called inner. Okay, inner circle. Okay, meaning a large portion of their population used English as their um, medium of communication, not just in teaching, but even in a daily conversation. Okay, and uh, English in this inner circle has developed its own norms and standards, and it is used as a medium of instruction in education, government, and other official settings. So as you can see, even their traffic signs and symbols, even um, when they speak, even when they go to a certain place, they use English. That's for the inner circle. But for the outer circle consists of countries where English has been institutionalized as a second language due to their historical and colonial reasons. The reason probably is that they were colonized by the inner circle countries. 
That's why it became their second language. So these countries include India, Pakistan, um, Singapore, Philippines. Philippines was colonized by um, the Americans. That's why we <clears> were <throat> um, influenced and we were able to uh, adopt their language, which, which is English. And it is now our second language. Okay. Even even some uh, Filipinos right now, their their first language is already English. Okay. And then we have the expanding circle here. It consists of countries where English is learned as a foreign language. It's English as a foreign language, and it is used primarily as a means of international communication. So it includes um, communicating via business through economics and other okay and other things that's why south koreans come here thais come here in the philippines they want to learn english because even japanese they really want to learn english because it is needed for international internationalization and also for business okay so what is asian englishes or asian englishes so there are different varieties of English that are spoken in ASEAN region, okay? And these varieties of English have been shaped by the unique cultural and linguistic context of each country. So because of this linguistic and cultural influence, they created their own Englishes. And it includes vocabulary, grammar, and pronunciation. So because of the influence of the culture of that certain country and because of its linguistic context, they came up with their own English. Although there's still touch of American or British English, but because of their linguistic and cultural influence, they came up with their English or Englishes. Okay. So here are some examples of ASEAN Englishes. So we have here the Singlish. Actually, when you say Singlish, it's Singaporean English, the combination of Singaporean language and the English language. So this variety of English incorporates vocabulary and grammar from Chinese, Malay, and Tamil, as well as unique um, colloquial expressions. That's for Singlish. And then we have the Manglish, spoken in Malaysia. So combination of uh, Malaysia and English, so Manglish. It includes vocabulary and grammar from Malay, Chinese, and Indian languages, as well as local slang. So they have their own um, local slang. I think most of the countries, they have their own local slang or local dialects. Okay, we have the Taglish. We have here in the Philippines, or we call it the Philippine English. Taglish is a mixture of the English and Tagalog. Okay, Taglish. Okay, Thai English, of course, spoken in Thailand, incorporates Thai language and culture using my pen rai. When you say my pen rai, no problem or never mind. In place of you're welcome. Instead of saying you're welcome, they will say my pen rai. Okay, so it's their own English version already. And then we have the fifth one. We have the Vietlish. Of course, Vietnam. So it incorporates Vietnamese vocabulary into English sentences. We have the Konglish. Okay. Konglish is spoken in uh, South Korea. Okay. Filipinos, they love Koreans. Okay. Um, Konglish is a combination of South Korean um, language and the English language. Um, that's why another an example of Konglish is that um for in english it's pizza but for them pija p i j a so see they got the word pija from the english word pizza and they converted that one into konglish which is pija okay next number 7 we have the brunei english spoken in brunei this variety of english incorporates malay vocabulary as well as arabic loan words when you say loan words, the one that I, I gave an, a while ago, an example, meaning we, we get a, a word from the English and then you created a new um, word of it 
Okay, and you, that's a loan word. Okay, Cambodian English spoken in Cambodia, of course, by, I hope I pronounce this well, Kamer Vocabulary and Sentence Structures. We also have Laotian English from Laos. And then um, for them, <laughs> excuse me, it has a more relaxed and informal tone. Okay, unlike for American accent and British accent, you can see in the British accent, like just like Harry Potter, they have this kind of accent, right? Compared to American English. But for Laotian English, they have an informal and relaxed way of speaking. Okay. And then we have the Burmese English spoken in Myanmar. Burmese English incorporates Burmese syntax and vocabulary and often uses direct translations from Burmese expressions. I will not be discussing all of this thoroughly, but I will, I'm just giving you a glimpse, okay? 11, we have the Hinglish from India, okay? Also heard parts of the ASEAN with Indian communities. So Hinglish is a blend of the Hindi and of course the English. And we have the Indo-English. Indonesian, okay, of course, incorporates with the English in terms of the grammar, distinct pronunciation and intonation. That's why I hope I can give you a, a good lecture with regard to Indonesian English later on based on my research and based on some of the researches, okay? So what are some key characteristics of ASEAN Englishes? So the first one is the vocabulary. Okay, they are characterized as unique vocabulary. Why? Because it came from local languages like the Malay, the Tagalog, the Thai, the Vietnamese, and the Indonesian. And with this, with this combination of these unique um, local languages, they blend with the English language, okay, and produced a distinct and vibrant language. Okay, and in terms of pronunciation, there is a big, big difference in terms of pronunciation. You might pronounce this word in the American American English, but it would be different if you pronounce if you if you pronounce this one in, of course, the Philippine English or in the Indonesian English. Okay, so the pronunciation of ASEAN Englishes can vary greatly depending on the speaker's first language. So what's the first language of the speaker? Okay, it will depend. Okay, so for example, speakers of Thai and Vietnamese may have difficulty pronouncing certain English sounds, just like the V and the TH. TH could be the, 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 the very uh, a hard the or the very soft th, okay, resulting in substitutions or emissions. That's why... When they speak, sometimes they do not pronounce anymore the V and the TH because it's hard for them to pronounce because their first language, okay, does not have such kind of uh, English sounds, okay? These are some, uh, these are just some of the key characteristics of ASEAN Englishes, okay? Just like, for example, um, in the American English, um, it is pronounced as indigent, okay? But... In the Philippines, they pronounce that one as indigent already, okay? So um, these are some examples. This, this is just an example, okay? Another characteristic of uh, ASEAN English is the grammar, okay? In general, ASEAN Englishes follow the standard rules of English grammar. Basically, the subject-verb agreement. Um, it was discussed to you by Dr. Jafar a while ago. And, but there are some exemptions. So, for example, in some countries, it is common to use the present continuous tense to express future events. As in, um, I am going to the market tomorrow. Okay, so they will say, I'm going to the market tomorrow, but some, they would say, I will go to the market, okay, tomorrow, okay. So there's still a difference there in terms of the grammar, okay. And we also have the code switching. ASEAN Englishes are often mixed with local languages or dialects, resulting in code switching. When we say code switching, 
from, from the English language, you code switch it to your um, local language. So from English, automatically you're gonna, after that, speaking the English, you code switch that Philippine words already or Indonesian word. That's code switching. Okay. And this is a common phenomenon in Southeast Asia where people may use multiple languages in the same conversation. So they, they code switch first Philippine uh, language and then they code switch it to English and then Philippine English again or Indonesian uh, language and then uh, English language. So code switching. This is one way for us to express ourselves. And the best way to explain, we use code switching. Okay. Next, we have number five, use of honorifics. Honorifics, I'm sorry. Respect and hierarchy are important in many ASEAN cultures. Okay. And this is reflected in the use of honorifics in English. Um, for example, in Malaysia and in Singapore, it is common to address someone as uncle or auntie as a sign of respect. Here in the Philippines, we say po or opo. Um, in South Korea, they, they, they have their own formal and informal language also. Okay, so use of honorifics. Okay, um, I, I do not know much in the Indonesian language. How, uh, what kind of... Uh, Words they use as a sign of respect. Probably you can put that in the chat box so that we could know. And then English as a lingua franca. English is often used as a common language between speakers of different local languages. This has led to the development of a unique form of English that is influenced by the local languages and the cultures of the region. Of the region. I told you a while ago, that because of the influence of the culture, okay, it changes the linguistic, um, the ling the linguistic uh, part of uh, the language itself. Okay. Next, we have their Indonesian English. Okay. So what is all about this Indonesian English? Okay. Indonesian English is um, a type of English that has been influenced by the Indonesian language and culture. It is commonly spoken in Indonesia, obviously, where English is not the primary language, but it is widely used as a second language already. Um, Indonesia, I believe, uh, um, is trying already to be part of the, uh, not of the expanding already. They want to be part already of the uh, um, outer circle. Okay, of the Englishes. Okay, Indonesian English can be identified by its unique vocabulary, grammar, and pronunciation. So, for example, um, Indonesian English speakers may use words and phrases that are not commonly used in standard English, such as bole. I hope I pronounce it well, bole, meaning allowed or permitted, or tidak apa apa, tidak apa apa meaning no problem or it's okay. In Thai a while ago, may panrai, right? Meaning no problem, no worries, okay? But for the Indonesian English, they have, they have the tida ka pa apa, okay? I hope I pronounce it correctly, <laughs> okay? So pronunciation in, in Indonesian English may also be influenced by the sounds of the Indonesian language. And for example, some Indonesian English speakers may pronounce V as F or W as V, okay? Next, we have uh, here, um, the Indonesian um, English is a result of the contact between the English language and the Indonesian language due to Indonesia's colonial past and its current status as a major player in international trade and tourism. English, has become an important language in their country. So Indonesian English has developed a means of communication among Indonesians who speak different regional languages and dialects, and also as a way of to communicate with foreigners. Um, there are a lot of foreigners, there are a lot of visitors there in Indonesia. So the use of the English language is very, very essential for them. And they use it for international trade and tourism, okay? 
One interesting aspect of uh, um, Indonesian English is its use of loan words from Indonesia. So meaning we got some um, Indonesian words. Uh, English language adopted some Indonesian words. Okay, loan words. And here are some of the examples. We have the bazaar. Okay, we use this one already in the English language. It's already in the uh, Merriam Dictionary. It's already in the Cambridge Dictionary. So the bazaar meaning market. We also have the batik. It's a type of traditional Indonesian fabric. And we have the aklung, a traditional Indonesian musical instrument. They are already part of the English language. These are the loan words. Okay, came from the Indonesian language or in the, uh, Indonesian English. Next, we also have the next one. So Indonesian English also has its own unique slang and idiomatic expressions. So for example, sudamakan, so meaning have you eaten? Okay, it's a common greeting in Indonesian English reflecting the importance of food in Indonesian culture. So they really uh, give importance to their food because it's part of their culture. Similarly, the word ajaib, meaning amazing or incredible, is often used as an exclamation in Indonesian English. So ajaib, every one of you, you are ajaib. Okay, so pronunciation in Indonesian English can vary depending on the speaker's background and level of proficiency in English. Some speakers may have a wrong Indonesian accent, while others may have a more standard English pronunciation. That's why um, some, of, some of the English teachers, they are very, very strict in terms of pronunciation. Uh, I myself, I'm quite uh, strict in terms of pronunciation. However, because of these Englishes, we already accepted some of the uh, pronunciation of words, okay? And we have to uh, put that in the minds of our English teachers and into the minds of our, of our language in English learners and even non-English learners with regard to world Englishes, okay? So there are several differences between Indonesian English and other Englishes. What is something unique? about uh, the Indonesian English. The one, the first one is the vocabulary, the use of loan words, the one that I told you a while ago, the use of aklung and batik, okay? And then we have the grammar. Um, and Indonesian English often follows uh, different rules of grammar than other English varieties. So for example, we have here, the double negatives are commonly used in Indonesian English. Okay, whereas they are considered incorrect in, in the American English, it's incorrect if you're going to use the double negatives. Okay, so additionally, Indonesian English may use different tenses and verbs, um, such as the use of have been instead of was for past continuous tense. So they interchange sometimes the have been and the was. Okay, next. We have here the pronunciation, okay? Indonesian English pronunciation may be influenced by the sounds of their Indonesian language, resulting to uh, differences in vowel and consonant sounds. For example, the Indonesian R sound may be pronounced differently than in other languages. They can be pronounced as R, R, okay? And other versions of R depending, of course, on their local language and their first language. And we respect that one. I believe that we should respect the pronunciation, the accent of other Englishes. And that is, uh, that is the one importance of embracing world Englishes, okay? Fourth one is the idiomatic expressions. So Indonesian English has its own unique idiomatic expressions that may not be commonly used in other English varieties. So for example, the one that I told you a while ago, tidak apa-apa, so no problem and it's okay. So this is one uh, unique okay, expression from the Indonesian English. 
And number five is spelling. Okay. So, um, Indonesian English spelling may differ from other Englishes. Um, we have, for example, here the word um, color. It is spelled as C-O-L-O-U-R. There's a U there. But in the American English, it's C-O-L-O-R. The C-O-L-O-U-R, British English. But for the C-O-L-O-R, that's for the American English. But in the Indonesian English, spelled as K-O-L-O-R. Okay? Indonesian English. Okay? And then we have the sentence structure. So Indonesian English may use different sentence structures. Like, for example... Um, Indonesian English may use the word already at the end of the sentence to indicate completion as in, I have finished already. That's for the Indonesian English. But in other Englishes, they put the word already in the middle. I have already finished. That's for other Englishes. But for the sentence structure in the Indonesian English, they put the word already at the last part of the sentence. See, that's the one unique characteristic of Indonesian English. And we also have number seven, the register. Indonesian English may have different levels of formality and politeness than other English languages or English uh, varieties reflecting the cultural norms of Indonesia. So um, Indonesian language may use honorifics and formal language in business and academic settings. That's why the Indonesians, they really have a high respect to their elders, to their supervisors, to their teachers, to their bosses. Whereas informal language may be used in casual conversations. So, overall, with regard to uh, um, Indonesian English, is that Indonesian English is a distinct variety of English that reflects the cultural and linguistic influences of Indonesia. You know what? The combination of culture and language combined as one changes its linguistics and come up with this Indonesian English. It's, it's, it's very abundant. It's very nice. So while it may differ in vocabulary, grammar, pronunciation, and idiomatic expressions from other English varieties, it is still va a valid and functional means of communication. I would like to emphasize that one. It is still a valid and functional means of communication. Do not disregard the Indonesian um, English. Do not disregard their vocabulary, the use of their grammar, their idiomatic expressions, their pronunciation, do not disregard because it is a valid and functional means of communication. So it's important to know that Indonesian English, like any other variety of English, is constantly evolving. That's why Indonesian learners and teachers are conducting a lot of researches, published researches with regard to Indonesian English and world Englishes. It is evolving and changing over time. So as Indonesia, as Indonesia continues to grow and develop as a global player, its influence on English is likely to continue to grow as well. So leading to further differences and variations in Indonesian English compared to other Englishes. You have your own variety of English. Does Indonesian English embrace it? use it, and it's valid, okay? Next, we are done with the Indonesian English. Now, I'll give you also a glimpse uh, with regard to Philippine English, okay? I know some of my students here already have an idea about the Philippine English. So, Philippine English, uh, part of the outer circle of Karu's model of world Englishes, so it is the language used by Philippines. Actually, this is a new term. Philippines is the new, neutral term for Philippine or Filipina. Okay, Filipino is a boy, Filipina is a girl. But if you want it to be neutral term, we call it Philippines. Okay, in controlling domains such as science and technology, the uh, the judiciary, the legislature, legislature, 
bureaucracy, higher education, scholarly discourse, and the like. Um, our constitution um, is written in English. Our signs and symbols, traffic signs here, are all uh, in the English language. Okay, so um, English is already part of our of our everyday conversation. Okay, whether you are inside the school or outside the school. Okay. But in terms of pronunciation, when you say Philippine English, it has five vowel sounds, the same with the uh, American English with a A, E, I, O, and U. However, some Filipinos tend to pronounce the A sound as a diphthong, making it la sound like A, E, like A, E, okay? But in the American English, there are a lot of A sound, okay? Also, for consonants, Philippine English tends to pronounce the V and the F sounds the same. So the F, they pronounce that one as V, okay? Instead of Philippines, Philippines, okay? Additionally, the TH sound is often pronounced as D or T. For example, this may be pronounced as this or this. Okay, uh, this is, instead of these, they pronounce that one as this. Okay, see the pronunciation in the Philippine English. Okay, next, we also have the uh, intonation. Philippine English has a rising intonation at the end of declarative sentences. Remember in the American English, you go down in terms of intonation if it's a declarative sentence. Like, for example, my name is Hartwell Norman Mirza. I go down at the end of the sentence, my tone. But for some in the Philippine English, ah, my name is Hartwell Norman Mirza. They go up. Okay. That's for the Philippine English in terms of intonation. Okay. So when you ask questions, you go up, especially if it's, um, if it's answerable by yes or no, a categorical question. Okay. You go up. Are you okay? They go up. Okay, but in the Philippines, they go down. Are you okay? Are you sure? Okay, instead of going up. Okay, so that's the intonation in the Philippine English. Um, another one is um, Philippine English is rhotic. When you say rhotic, the local R is an alveolar flap, not an American English retroflex. So meaning in the American English, they pronounce the R, water, okay? But in the Philippines, water, kind of, they, they kind of prolong it, okay? And then it is a syllable timed following the rhyme of the local languages. Full value is therefore given to unstressed syllables and a little bit of schwa is usually realized as a full vowel. So... Certain polysyllables have distinctive stress patterns. For those who are done with their phonology, you know this one. Just like this one, eligible instead of eligible. The pronunciation in the Philippine English is eligible. And then establish instead of establish. And when you have their ceremony, that's for the Philippine English. But in the American um, English, ceremony. Okay, see the difference in terms of the pronunciation. Um, we also have the intonation is widely characterized as sing-song. When you say sing-song, they go up, they go down. So when they speak, they go up. Ah, my name is Hartwell Norman Mirza. How about you? Oh, really? And then this one, they go up, they go down. It's as if they are singing. Okay. Next, um, educated Filipinos aim an American English accent. Some um, educated Filipinos, they try to uh, imitate the American accent, but having uh, ha but have varying success with a vowel contrast, just like this one, sheep, ship. But for the Philippine English, they will just say sheep and ship, as if there's no, uh, there's no difference. Fool, uh, fool, fool. But for the Philippine English, Full, full, okay? And then boat, bought. But for them, the same, bought, bought, okay? 
few Filipinos have the A-E sound. Unlike in American English, they pronounce this one as mask. But for Filipinos, mas. Instead of using the A, uh, they use the, uh, uh, just like this one, father. They use A, uh, father. Okay. But in the American English, they pronounce this one as mas. A-E sound. Just like the word black, B-L-A-C-K, black. It's pronounced in the American English. But in the Philippine English, black. Okay, so the distinction between the S, Z, I mean S, Z, okay, and the CH, okay, there, and the TH is not made, okay, just like this one. Um, they will pronounce this one as assure, azure, instead of azure, pleasure, okay, but in the Philippines, they will say pleasure, okay. What about this one? Cease. Instead of sees the day. But this one, cars. Instead of cars. Okay. Interdental are often rendered as T and D. So that three of these is spoken as three of these. Instead of pronouncing that one as three of these, they will pronounce this one as three of these. That's Philippine English. Okay. Now, in terms of the grammar, there are some English words used differently in the Philippines. Just like the word chancing, chancing is like more on a sexual, uh, there is a um, sexual interaction there. But if you check in the dictionary of chancing, it's a different one. Eat all you can. Only in the Philippines that we have the eat all you can. Okay, even the word salvage. Salvage is killing in the Philippine English, but if you check in the dictionary, it's a different meaning. Okay, even the word live in, only in the Philippines that we use live in, bed space, double deck, comfort room. In the Philippines, we call it comfort room. When I went to Thailand, they call it toilet. Okay, and we also have the boodle fight. When you say boodle fight, all the food are uh, on the table and then all of you will eat there simultaneously. Okay, using your hand. Okay. That's the Buddha fight. So meaning we are using this kind of words differently in the Philippines. And that's Philippine English. Okay. Even this one, with regards. The Philippines, they put S. But in the American English, it should be with regard. Okay. Even the word feedback, they, we put S there. But actually, um, in the Philippine, uh, I mean, in the American English, they, we do not put their S, feedback only. That's the plural and singular form. Even the word equipment. Okay. In the Philippines, we use S. Okay. But in other Englishes, equipment only. Okay. We also have the on behalf of, in behalf of. Okay. Um, you use on behalf of if you are representing a certain organization or a group of people. But in behalf of, you are representing a certain organization or group of people by trying to help and giving donations or giving services. So that's the difference huh, between on behalf of and in behalf of. Okay, We have there... Dirty kitchen. Only in the Philippines that we have the word dirty kitchen. Can you go to the dirty kitchen? Okay. And we use also this dirty ice cream. You see dirty ice cream, the vendor selling ice cream along the street. Okay. We call that dirty ice cream. Although it's not dirty. Okay. But I'm not really sure if it's dirty <laughs> or clean. Okay. And we also have the high blood. We use high blood if the person is very angry. Okay. And we use the word nosebleed. We use nosebleed, not literally that your nose is bleeding, but we say nosebleed. If the person you're speaking with always um, use the English language every now and then, and you cannot, uh, you cannot be, you cannot go through with the conversation because you are quite intimidated, and you say, "Ah, oh, nosebleed." I cannot. I would not be. I am not able to get your 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 the meaning of your sentence. Okay. Now, in terms of vocabulary and idioms, we have some loans or loan words from Spanish. So we have the asalto, meaning surprise party, bienvenida, because Philippines was colonized also by the Spaniards for more than 300 years. 
That's why there are a lot of Spanish words that we adopted in the Philippine Eng Philippine um, language. So we have despedida, we call it farewell party. We have plantilla for faculty assignments. And then we have the viand, okay, a dish, okay. We also have loan words from Tagalog or Filipino words. The word bondok from the word bundok in the Philippine language, it means the mountain. The carabao came from the calab calabao. And then the water buffalo, or we call it the water buffalo. And then kondiman is a love song, which is already part of the English language. And then we have the sampalo from the, 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 the word sampalo with a K. And then we have the uh, fruit, which is the fruit tamarind. And we have the taonan, meaning common tao or common people. Okay. Now, what about in terms of code switching? Okay. So a register has developed for rapport and intimacy that depends on code, code mixing and code switching. Um, when we say code mixing, you mix the two languages, the, the, the Philippine language and the English language. You mix it. Or code switching, the first one would be Philippine language and then American English. And then later on, American English or later on, um, Philippine English. It is largely confined to Metro Manila. Uh, Manila City is the capital of the Philippines and it's an urbanized city and extensively used in motion pictures and in television, and even in the different types of informal writing in daily newspapers and weekly magazines. Um, in some magazines and newspapers already in the Philippines, they use the Philippine English, and they use code mixing and code switching. Just like, for example, here, Pexman, meaning um, she swears, wala pang nangyayari sa amin ni Marlon, meaning, um, cross my heart, she swears, nothing yet has happened between Marlon and me. So from the movie gossip column. So meaning there is already code switching there and code mixing. Okay. And then we have some issues and concerns with regard to uh, the use of the Indonesian English and the Philippine English. Okay. I, I think uh, I have... Uh, I still have time, I'm Sintara. I believe so. Okay. So, comparison of other Englishes. The problem now with the world Englishes, we have the Indonesian English, we have the Philippine English, and other Englishes is that the inferiority and superiority of Englishes. Okay. Other Englishes might say, oh, we should be, we should be the one there at the top because we are at first the, the American English or the British English. This is now an issue. Okay, of inferiority and superiority of Englishes. Another one is the colonial mentality. When you say colonial mentality, it's in our mind that, ah, they are Americans, um, American English, they are uh, much higher than us. So that's our mentality. And it's an issue. Attitude toward Indonesian English or Philippine English. What do you mean by this one? I will connect that one in the fourth here, acceptance. Uh, what's our attitude with regard to Indonesian English and Philippine English? Do we embrace it totally? Are we embracing it totally? Are we informing others about this Indonesian English and Philippine English? Are we accepting it? Because if we do not accept this one, how can we be able to put into the map about Indonesian English and about Philippine English? I think it's high time that we put into the map of the world about the Indonesian English and the Philippine English. That's why we are also uh, having this kind of webinar to inform others. And we conduct researches about this one. And you know what? There are already journals, World Englishes Journals, Asian Journals, uh, Asian English, Englishes Journals, meaning they are accepting researches about Englishes. And another issue and concern here is research publication. If we're going to use the American, uh, if we're going to use the Indonesian English or the Philippine English, sometimes um, they reject our research article, maybe because it's not in their standard way of English. So maybe because the publisher are from Europe 
or from the, the USA, of course, they will use, they, will, they prefer American English and British English. So this is an issue in the research application. So as a conclusion, I think I, I am in my second to the last uh, slide or probably the third to the last slide. Conclusions, the use of uh, ASEAN Englishes is an important aspect of language diversity and cultural identity in the, re in the region. They reflect the complex linguistic and cultural histories of the Asian countries and are often used as a marker of national and regional identity. I want to emphasize this one, marker of national and regional identity. Indonesian English, that's your identity. Philippine English, that's your identity. However, the use of um, ASEAN Englishes can also uh, present challenges in communication, particularly the one that I told you a while ago, international context, where standard English is often used as a lingua franca, um, others, they only accept British English and American English. So those are some issues. So it is important for speakers of Asian Englishes to be aware of these differences and to develop an effective communication strategies that take into account the linguistic and cultural nuances of their English varieties. The use of ASEAN or ASEAN Englishes reflects the diversity and complexity of language. We have a diverse, rich, abundant culture in our region. Let's try to highlight it. Highlights the importance of embracing linguistic diversity in our globalized world. Let's put in the map that we have these Englishes, the Indonesian English and the Philippine English. With that, terima kasih. Thank terima you. Kasih. Terima 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 Pertaining to Nautilus, yeah, so now I can see the reason why they've been pronouncing Nautilus as not that very much. So again, thank you very much. Uh, so then it's already on the last box so that you can have your attendance for this uh, fee because we will be using that to give you your certificate. So now the first also done with the second lecture. We are now going to open the Q&A session for this lecture. Do we have questions or maybe some clarifications or theories from our audiences? I'm going to check if someone can or by the me. We all know thoughts. Or you can raise your hands if you have questions for both of our lecturers. Do we have any questions? Okay, I don't think we have any questions. <laughs> okay, if you also give your questions to all, sir, so that for those who wanted to have it, your presentation, we can also give them uh, if it is okay. If it is okay. Okay, anyway, so thank you very much again, Dr. Marza and Dr. Jafar. Okay, I'm going okay. to pronounce your name yeah. right now. Yeah, welcome. Jafar, thank I've you. been saying how far earlier, so from the lesson of Dr. Marza, yes. <laughs> I think I'm going to shift on to my Indonesian English now. Dr. Jafar. Terima kasih. Selamat. Selamat, Dr. Jafar. Selamat. Terima kasih. Thank you, thank you. So we already actually done the whole of this first session. So please use the button on the bottom of the screen to express our gratitude and appreciation for all the speakers. I want to give them, of course, my heart reaction. So thank you very much again. So for 
again, it's a reminder, please fill in and the attendance link that we have on our chat box. The spelling of your full name, okay? And as um, a reminder for everyone, this is only the first series for the uh, series, yeah, first session. We are going to have the next session, which is session three next week COVID topic on phonological awareness and digital literacy and the language of new age media. So I guess we are still going to see our hundred plus participants next week. So if we don't have any more questions or any more questions, this the end for the first session for the next or so, just read again the title of our seminar, which is quite long, for our international lectures on English Education Studies Program and Language Department. Again, this is Nathan Parag and B. Advenkula, your host and moderator for today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. God bless everyone. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you sir. Yes. Thank you, participants. Thank you, Ma'am Sintara. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for working yeah. For the first time, and to be here. Okay, before you leave this Zoom meeting, please post on the standard person link. So I'll see you again on our next session. Thank you, Ma'am Sindara. Thank you, Dr. Hadwell. Thank you, Pak Jafar. Thank you, Ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Sik. <laughs>